so last time Phil was my MC, uh, I lost my passport in Belgium. Uh, I don't blame him, but I, I do. It's, it was his fault. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so um, we're going to make, oh, this is, sorry, this slide is for a different audience. Uh, so we're going to do, I want to do a little bit of a conference recap here. I want to recap all the presentations that we've seen so far today. So I'm going to do that very quickly. Uh, Xavier's talk with music to my ears. Uh, <laughs> Coraline's talk about Neo4j was great. I did not know that they used Java in the Matrix. Uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed Courtney's talk about open source for my benefit. Apparently, I've been doing open source wrong. <laughs> Janet's talk was great, but she gave me the impossible task of coming up with a pun about gender inequality, but I think I did it. <laughs> Cognitive bias really makes you think. <laughs> Sorry. And, <laughs> it's too bad. And, and finally, Zach, <laughs> Zach got me fired up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't like these fun puns, you can feel free to Brexit the building. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I was really honored to be invited to Bath Rugby, uh, but I, I don't really know anything about rugby, so instead I'm going to talk about programming. Uh, and I guess some of, my, some of my slides do have color in it, but we'll see how we can fare. Ooh, it's pretty. Um, we're going to talk about how methods are formed today. Uh, I want to talk, I, I, my alternative title to this was Method Mania, uh, but first I want to introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I work for a company called Red Hat. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of them. They're a small startup company in the United States. <laughs> uh, specifically, I'm on the Manage IQ team, and our team at Red Hat uh, manages cloud stuff. So if you have cloud stuff, uh, we can manage your cloud stuff. Uh, and actually, our, app, our application is open source, and you can look at the source on GitHub. It's just manage IQ on GitHub, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. Also, we are hiring. OK. So my name is Aaron Patterson, and I have come from the United States to bring you freedom. <laughs> Uh, and I have to tell you, I have to tell you, I, <laughs> I gave a talk in Moscow and used this exact same joke. <laughs> <laughs> and it went over, like, extremely well. I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, like, so I like to pay attention to the news and stuff, and I've noticed that with the recent political climate here uh, in Europe, I think this might actually be better. I'm from the European Union. <laughs> I'm trying to bring you... Freedom. Uh, that was supposed to be a Belgian waffle, but as an American, I have no idea what those look like. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I'm excited to be in England because uh, it's really cool because everybody here has an accent. Uh, it's, also, it's also neat. Like It's kind of a novelty. I'm in a foreign country, and everybody speaks my language. So that's, that's really, really cool. I also feel like I'm in some sort of... like romantic comedy where I've been whisked away to England and everything's like, oh, it's England, wow, it's so romantic. Anyway, I, another reason I like coming to England is because I don't feel so bad using freedom units here. Uh, for those of you that don't know, that's like, so you might refer to some things as 10 degrees C, where we would say F, where, uh, and we don't use C in the United States because C stands for communism and F stands for freedom. <laughs> so like, that's, that's what we do. There. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I don't feel so bad using those units here. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm very, very honored to be here. Like, truly, I'm so happy to be here in, in Bath. The city is very beautiful, uh, and I really do love coming to England. Uh, and I, I tried to come up with uh, an emoji for this conference, and this is the best I could come up with. Is uh, <laughs> So there's no... <laughs> That's bath and then root B, so bathroom B. <laughs> now, many of you might not know this, but there is actually a very important computer science discovery made here in Bath. You might not notice this, but I was researching this on Wikipedia that I put in there. Uh, and 
<laughs> One of the most famous sorting algorithms was invented here at Bath College by a man named Alexander Graham Bubble. <laughs> now, now, Bubble, he invented the bubble sort. And <laughs> just so you're putting this together, the bubble sort was actually invented in Bath. Get it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how much time do we have left? <laughs> All right. Also, another weird thing, I noticed that my hotel room only has a shower, so I thought that was kind of weird. Like, I thought you were supposed to have a bath here. The other thing is, so, so I, to get here, I took a train, and I just feel like the entire country of England is playing a joke on me. Because I, I went to purchase a ticket to get here, and I go to the window, and I'm like, yes, I need a ticket to uh, Bath Spa. Is that a valid place name? And they're like, yes, here's your ticket to Bath Spa. They, they didn't think it was so weird at all, but uh, to me it was just very weird. Also, last night we were talking about how there's two different pronunciations, Bath and Bath. I think, and there, people are going on, yeah, you, that's the right way to say it, and I could not tell the difference. I'm like, you're both saying the same thing. It doesn't make sense. What is going on? <laughs> anyway, so I love cats. Um, this is my cat, one of them. That's SeaTac, SeaTac Airport Facebook YouTube is her name. Uh, that's her full, that's her legal name. Uh, <laughs> We just call her Choo Choo for short, and then this is, this is also her. She likes to sit on my desk, so I think that's very cute, but also in the way a lot. Uh, and then this is the other one. He's a bit more famous. This is Gorbachev, Gorbachev Puff Puff Thunder Horse. That's his, his full name. I actually wanted, so when my wife and I got married, I wanted to change our last names to Thunder Horse, because I think it's awesome, but um, she would not have it, so that's too bad. Anyway, my wife really wanted me to give a TED talk someday, so she made this slide for me. But I don't know anybody named Ted, so I can't do that. Um, <laughs> also, I enjoy hugs, and today is Friday, so I would like you, I'm not gonna make you all do it now, but tonight, after this, after this uh, shindig, that's, an Ameri that's so American of me to say. <laughs> Uh, please come give me a hug for being on Friday. Uh, so today we're going to talk about methods. Let's, let's talk about methods. Um, we're going to talk about methods, and we're going to talk about method optimizations. So I want to talk about methods. I want to talk about types of methods, how methods work, uh, and also bytecode for methods and some VM internals. And then after we talk about how methods work, I want to talk about method optimization. So I want to talk about inline caches, polymorphic methods, uh, polymorphic inline caches, and then optimization tests. And I want, like, I hope you're all very, very proud of me because you, you may have noticed that I localized here <laughs> for all of you. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm trying, to lay, I'm trying to lay all of this out for you so that you know that there is a method to my madness. More localization right there. <laughs> so this is, this is a highly technical presentation. This is a very technical presentation. That's how we're going to end the day today. But I actually want to start out on a not-so-technical not so note at the beginning. I usually give very technical presentations, but I want to start out with a little bit uh, kind of some serious stuff that is not so technical. I want to give some, I want to give some advice for new people in the audience, people who are new to programming or new to the industry, and also those of you who have been here for a while. I want you to kind of listen in too. I want to talk a little bit about accessibility. Uh, this presentation I'm giving, I'm going to be talking about some very complicated topics, but I'm going to be building on easy stuff at the very beginning and then getting into more difficult stuff as we go on. But my goal with this presentation is to ensure that everybody in the audience can get something out of this, out of this talk. So yes, there will be very difficult concepts, but we're going to introduce those slowly. So hopefully some of the new developers here can get that, get that information as well. But the thing I want to pass on to you, especially to new people, is don't be embarrassed about asking questions about this stuff. Some of this stuff is very difficult, and I remember a, time, a point in my career where I was afraid to ask questions of my colleagues because I thought, hey, if I ask this question, am I going to look stupid? And I think it's very important, for, especially for new people, to not feel that way. I want to foster an environment where you feel okay to ask questions about anything that's being shown or anything in the industry because all of us had to learn that stuff at some point. So you shouldn't feel embarrassed if you don't know something. 
The other thing I want you to do is, to, when you're asking these questions, be genuine about what you ask. Be genuine about trying to learn something. And the thing is, if you ask questions of somebody and you're generally trying to learn and they do think you're stupid for doing that, you probably don't want to work with those people. So just pro tip for all of you. So if you notice that somebody really doesn't understand something and they're being genuine about it, please help them out. Try to make them feel comfortable. So we're going to talk about some very high-level stuff. We're going to go from high-level concepts down into low-level concepts, and we're going to be uh, sort of oscillating between those two. So we'll talk about high-level stuff with methods, and we're going to dig down deeper and then come back up for air once in a while. Uh, so let's get started with this. Um, I'm excited to give this presentation because this is the first time I've been able to talk about this, this stuff that I've been working on, but I also want you to forgive me a little bit because this is the first time I've given this presentation, so it might be a little bit rough around the edges. But the first thing I want you to know is that, like, TLDR, if you don't want to watch the rest of this presentation, I failed. That's basically it. I failed. <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk about that, we'll talk about that failure at the end and you'll understand how I was a failure. Uh, but I want to talk about the stuff I learned along the way. So the first thing that we're going to cover is call sites, call sites and programs, and we're going to define what those are. Uh, call sites are pretty easy to identify in your code. They look, they look something like this. This is a call site. Anywhere where you see a dot, that's going to be a call site. That's a call site. And I'm going to refer to some things, like on the left here, I'm going to refer to that as the left-hand side. Yeah, the left-hand side of the calls our call site, and the other side, I'm going to refer to that as the right-hand side. Ah, yes. <laughs> Highly technical. So an important thing about this is that call sites, call sites are unique. So if I had that hello world listed five times, we'd have five different call sites there. And I want to show you some more examples of them in, in Ruby. Uh, these are, this is a short code example here. So we have a call site up here. We just saw that one. Uh, we actually have another one right here where we're saying object.new. Our left-hand side is uh, object class. Our right-hand side is new. Uh, we've got another one here that's, we've got an implicit left-hand side. That's our self. So it's actually self.foo. It's just so we can omit the self. Dot. And in the case of this, uh, it's actually main. So if you write a quick Ruby script and you just do like put self from that script, you'll see that it says main. So that's our main object. Uh, we've got a few more as well. Yes, so left, good job, Aaron. <laughs> left hand side, self, thanks. Oh, I gotta remember, I'm trying to break, I'm trying to break the, the sixth wall. Are we doing six wall? I'm breaking six walls. Hello, viewers at home. <laughs> Wait, should I say hi, mom? <laughs> All right, so more call sites. We got some more code down here at the bottom. There's one more here, when object, that's, that is one, that's equivalent to doing object, object triple equals x. So you could write that when out as the same thing as object triple equals uh, x, but we're going to have some more notes about that. That's an interesting one. And of course, we've got another one here, the double equals, that's a method call. We've got another one here, an implicit uh, call to self. And the point I'm trying to make here is that we actually have tons of these. They're all over our code. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. You might not necessarily notice them, but they're definitely there. They're there throughout our code base. All right. So let's do a little quick review of how Ruby's virtual machine works. So the way Ruby's VM works is it's a stack-based virtual machine. And what that means is we have a list of instructions, and we have a stack that the virtual machine works on. It takes those instructions, and it uses that stack to uh, work out values. So for example, we have this tiny little program here. Uh, the way that this works is we've got our byte code. It's just a list here on the left. Uh, and on the right is our stack that we work with. So what this byte code does is it says, OK, we're going to push 6 onto the stack. 6 shows up on the stack. Then we push 8. So now 6 and 8 are both on the stack. And then we say add. And what that does is that pops both of those values off, adds them together, and then pushes the value back onto the stack. So that's how stack-based machine works, and that's how MRI's virtual machine works. And what's interesting about the bytecode stored, or the MRI uses, is that it's actually just stored as an array. So if you look internally, uh, the bytecode looks something like this. If I were to write it in Ruby, it would look like this. It's, it's just an array, and it's got some more arrays inside that array. So it's basically a two-dimensional array. So we have, on the left of that, we have the operator, what we call the operator, and then we have an operand. So we're saying push six. 
Uh, What's, what I really want to drive home with this is that this bytecode is actually allocated and stored somewhere. It's, it's there, it is a physical thing. Well, okay, maybe not physical. It is a thing that is inside our computer, stored in memory, and it's actually there, and we can manipulate it, okay? So the next thing I want to talk about is how methods work. Methods from a high level, what they need to do is they need to find the name of the method. What we have to do is find the name of the method, then we find the type on the left-hand side. Then given the name that we found, given the name that we have, we have to go execute that method. We look up that method off of that object and go execute that code. So from a low level, a very low level, we're going to look at the byte code for how that actually happens. We'll take this example here. We had foo and bar, and we're, can, we're going to get the instruction sequence for that. And this is the Ruby code, or the... This is specific to MRI uh, for getting the bytecode for that particular uh, method. So if we print that out, it's going to look something like this, which is kind of difficult to read. But really, the things we want to focus on are these two lines here, where it says four and six, this get local. That is, that is our method call. So if we have two method calls, let's say we do that twice, and we look at the bytecode from that, we'll see, again, we have those two, those two lines repeated twice. So we can actually map this bytecode back to our original code. If we look at uh, the original code we have there, that's the original method. You can see that this get local op02, what that is doing is it's getting the left-hand side, this bar, and it's pushing that onto the stack. And then the next operation is actually calling the method. We're going to call the method baz on bar. So that is what this op send without block instruction does. So here, again, we have our operator and our operand. Uh, and then we have this, uh, again, we have that down here with the op send without block. And then we have a third argument there, right there, that we're going to cover a bit more in depth la later. But this is, what, this is what the actual bytecode looks like for executing a method. So if we were to look at the stack on this, when this is executing, we'll say, OK, we're going to call, take this, eh, go transitions, there we go bar, we're going to push that bar onto the stack. The VM is then going to execute the method against bar. So it'll pop, go, come on, go, computer. It'll pop bar off the stack, call baz on it, get the return value from that, and then push the return value back onto the stack. Go transitions, yes. So that's how it does it. Now, what I want to look at is we're going to go a little bit deeper here. We're going to look at this opt send without block. We're going to look at the C code for that. And the place you can find that in uh, MRI is in this file called insns.def. So if you ever dump that bytecode and you look at those uh, symbols on the left-hand side, each of those map to a section inside of this file, inside of this insns.def. So if you're curious about what opt send without block is, just open up that file, go search for it, and then the code will be right there in the block. So this is, this is our opt code. Uh, and you can see down here, this, it's very short. That's the entire thing. We'll say, OK, we're going to search for the method. Once we've found the method off of that object, we're going to call the method. That's it. That's all there is to it. We're done. Yay. We can go have a beer now. So <laughs> let's talk about finding the method, because we kind of left this out. Uh, in order to find the method, we, or in order to call the method, we have to be able to find it, right? And that method is defined somewhere. So how do we find that method? I'm going to cover the algorithm for doing that. And I kind of rewrote it here in Ruby so that it would be a little bit easier to understand. The C code is not as fun to read. So essentially what we're doing is we say, hey, class, tell me what methods you have. Get the class for the object. Say, what methods do you have? If it doesn't have those methods, it goes and looks at the super class. And if that one doesn't have it, it just repeats the process. So we keep going up the tree. So for example, if we had a structure that looked like this, and we're calling a.new.foo, in order to find that foo method, the way that it looks is we have this inheritance hierarchy. And we say, hey, do you have foo? Uh, I'm going to look at the method table. Nope, you don't. All right, I'm going to go up and look at class B, check its method table. Nope, no, no foo there. Now let's go check the method table on C. Nope, not there. Then finally go up to D. Yes, it's there. We've found the method. We can call it hooray. So we could say that looking up this method is an ON operation where the number, the, that N is the size of our stack, or that N is the number of classes that we're inheriting from. So in other words, we could say the more ancestors there are, the slower the method call is. I'm kind of lying. 
We'll look at it. Hold on. So let's test, to test this theory, let's test method speed. If I, what I'm saying is, oh, <laughs> wow, it's less pink. Can we put it back? <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. So if what I'm saying is true, we should be able to take a class that has 10 ancestors and then another one that has 10,000 ancestors and compare the two and see that one is slower than the other. So I did exactly that. We have this, we have this, this code here that creates one class that has 10 ancestors and another class that has 10,000 ancestors. And it's not actually 10,000. There's a little bit more in there because of the built-in classes. So if I run that, run this code, and for those of you that don't know, this is a, an IPS benchmark or iterations per second. What this means is the higher the number is, the better it is, the faster it can run, because we're doing iterations per second. So the higher that number is, the faster it is. Excuse me. Oh, yay, transition. Uh, so when we run this code and you look at the output, here's the output right here, and the numbers are almost exactly the same. So it actually doesn't matter whether the, there are 10 or 10,000 ancestors. So how, how is this possible? We looked, at the, we looked at the algorithm for finding this method. How is, it, how is it possible that they're the same speed? So what I want to talk about next is speeding up method calls. The way that we do that, the way that we can speed up a method call is essentially we cache things that never change. So if something never changes, we don't need to compute it over and over again. We can just cache it. If we take a look at this benchmark, if you look at this code, you'll notice that the variable 10, its ancestors never change. Same thing with 10,000. Its ancestors never change. Since the ancestors never change, we can just do that method lookup once. So we do that method lookup once, we cache it, and then we can just reuse that cache over and over again. So the question is, I know many of you are probably using a cache at, at work in your applications, and you're like, I'm going to use an in-memory cache, or I'm going to use a Redis cache, or whatever, you know, memcache cache. But you have an idea of where this cache is. It has to be somewhere. It has to live somewhere. So where do these caches live? These caches actually live inside the bytecode itself, and that's what I was pointing out in the third argument there. That value right there called call cache, that is the cache. That is where these uh, method lookups are cached. And it's per call site. Now, since this cache is stored in line with the bytecode, it is in line in the bytecode, we can call this an inline cache. OK, so we have what is called an inline cache here. Now, what I want to talk about next is something that's uh, slightly pertinent to your applications. And now I'm nervous of this. It's going to fall on me. <laughs> <laughs> it is improbable that I will die on stage, but not impossible, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so if somebody ever says to you, breaking method cache, this code breaks method cache, uh, what, this is what I want to talk about. This is, what, this is what they're talking about. If we look at these uh, call sites, so we have these, all these call sites here. These are our, this is our code that we were looking at earlier. We've got all these call sites. All of these call sites contain a cache, right? That call cache, the one that we pointed out in the bytecode, they're all stored there, although this one that is now pink is different. And we're going to talk about that one now because I think it's, it's very interesting. Well, I think it's very interesting. We're going to take a slight detour here. So we talked earlier about how when, when you do when, it's the same thing as object tri triple equals something else. So let's take a very slight detour about case when versus an if statement. If we look at this code here, these two bits of code on the left should be equivalent, right? When we read that, they do the same thing. So it's the same, they do the same thing. Just one is an if, else if, and the other one is a case when. So what's interesting is if we benchmark the two of these, if you, if you benchmark those two, you'll notice here that the case when version is actually slower than the if else version, which I think is very, very interesting, even though the two do exactly the same. And the reason is because this one on the left here, where we actually have that triple equals written out, we have a call site there that has a cache, where this one, this case when statement, doesn't have a cache. There's no cache there. And you can actually see this if you do, uh, if we take a look at the bytecode. If we pull up the bytecode for both of those things, you'll see that they look almost exactly the same. So at the top, we're doing a get inline cache that has nothing to do, confusingly, has nothing to do with 
this inline cache that we're talking about today. Ignore, ignore that it says cache. Just ignore that. <laughs> that call cache there on the left that I'm pointing out isn't, isn't here on the bottom. So this, this check match is essentially the same thing as that triple equals call. Though one, one doesn't have a, a, an inline cache and the other one does. And what I'm trying to say to you is don't go changing all of your case, case when statements to triple equals. Please don't do that. We should, we should basically just fix this. It's just something we need to fix. So I'm working on a thing to essentially just drop a cache into the byte code there. But I did think it was very interesting when we're looking at this that those case when statements don't actually expand to the triple equals. They have their own special byte code, and that byte code doesn't have a cache. So again, we have, our, we have all these caches here. And what I think is neat, well, maybe it's not that neat, it's important to uh, doing optimizations for this code is that these caches are everywhere, so the size of this cache matters. If we increase the size of the cache, then it's going to increase the size of our entire program, possibly. So we need to be, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but we have to be mindful of that. All right, so we're talking about caches, and we found the location of the cache, uh, and we know what it does, but what do we actually store in that cache? What is actually stored in there? What's stored in the cache is, a, is just a key and a value. The key is a serial number for the class. Each class has a serial number, and the value is the actual method itself. Okay? So we're going to talk about that serial, that serial number and the value of the cache. Now, this is, when we're talking about breaking method caches, what we're talking about is changing that serial number. We all know this when we get cache, mi cache mi misses in production. We're, we've got the wrong key. So how can we get that key to change? I want to talk about different things that make that key change in Ruby. So how, how to make cache misses. So the first thing we need to do is actually know how to tell whether or not there's a cache miss. And we can do that with uh, rubyvm.stat. If you run this code, you'll get, these, you'll get these values out. These are three uh, important values, but they are implementation specific. If that top number changes, the global method state, what you want to look for is changes in these numbers. If that top, method or that top number changes, that's very bad. It's V bad. I'm trying to, like shorten words that don't need to be shortened, because I noticed that that's what young people do today. So it's V bad. <laughs> so if that top number changes, that's very bad. And the reason it's very bad is because that one impacts every single cache throughout your, throughout your code. Now, we talked about how all those caches are in all those different places. When the cache key changes, it only impacts it only impacts those particular call sites. So if you have a call site that's associated with class A, if you modify class A, it'll only impact those call sites. Now, the global state, that one impacts all of those. So if you change that number, it's extremely bad. This number, if this number changes, it's not great, but we want to avoid changing it if possible. Uh, now, in, in the course of putting together this presentation, I was like, well, I'd really, like to show, I'd really like to show examples of these numbers changing so that people can actually see it. So I decided to throw it in an RSpec test. And if you print out VM stat in all of these, if you look at the output from this, from this program, you'll actually see that every test changes the class serial number. So you'll see that increasing through, through each of the... Uh, each of your it statements. So basically, RSpec is breaking method caches when each of, these, each of these it statements ran. So I actually filed a bug about this, and we're working on trying to figure out a way to fix that. So don't, like, uh, don't go switching off RS, ah, screw RSpec, ah, these numbers are increasing, it's terrible. Uh, <laughs> it's fine, don't worry about it. Anyway, so how do we, how do we actually break this cache? We can do it when we, whenever we define new modules, you'll see that class serial number change. Whenever you define a new class, you'll see that class number change. Whenever you reopen a class, you'll see that serial number change. So if we're doing that stuff at runtime, it's bad. But if we do it at boot time, like we're doing here, it's fine. We're doing that once. And when we're done with that, it's going to be stable throughout the lifetime of your process, which is what you want. You want those numbers to stay stable. It's fine if they change, but as long as they're stable, that's what we really want. So any of these misses at boot time is amortized across the, the life of your process, so it doesn't matter at boot. 
So let's look at some runtime breakage. Right? To, do, to look at runtime breakage, I wrote this little, tiny little method up here at the top so you can say, like, hey, let's take a look at, you know, print out the differences. And you'll see here this one on the left, there's no change there. Everything is fine with that one. On the right, if we extend an instance, uh, if we do an instance exec, or if we call dot singleton class, those will break your method caches. And actually, those two, those two on the bottom, that, those are the ones that RSpec is doing. Uh, and the way that these are breaking the cache is that they're accessing that object singleton class. So if you have an instance of foo, that object's type isn't just foo, because you might have monkey patched it. If you monkey patched it, those monkey patches go on to the, sing the singleton class. So actually, its class is the singleton class. So anytime we do a class, singleton class ac access, uh, we'll break cache for that particular instance. So we can, we can do a mapping here. We can say, OK, let's take a look at what A's class is, what its so-called real class is versus B's class. And I made a little diagram there. You can see B, since we're not monkey patching it or anything, since we're not accessing its singleton, its real class is foo. It is really just a foo. Since we're doing an instance exec on A and we're adding a method to it, that method needs to go somewhere. That method goes on to the singleton class of that instance. So that, class is, that instance's class, its real class, is that, that uh, singleton class on the right. So when you say class of some instance, we're going to get a singleton in the top case and we're going to get a normal class on the uh, in the bottom case. So cache misses occur. Uh, usually at boot, or whenever we have new classes or modules at boot time, or when we're accessing singleton, singleton objects. Uh, as long as the, as long, like I said, as long as this number doesn't change while you're running your application, you should be fine. Uh, and we've actually done tests in this in Rails to ensure that this number doesn't increase as we're pushing requests through the application. But if you ever do any tests, we don't, we don't have any regression tests for this. Uh. Surprise. <laughs> so if you ever see this actually happening in Rails, it shouldn't be happening, so let us know. So the next thing I want to talk about for cache misses is uh, the, the stuff that we looked at earlier is, is kind of questionable, if you think about it. Normally, defining those classes is fine. Defining classes and modules is fine. But as soon as we start accessing singleton classes, it's getting a little bit questionable. When you see that instance exec, I expect your eyebrow to go, hmm. What's going on here? Well, if we're, doing an, uh, if we're doing an include or an extend against an instance, that might raise your eyebrow. But what I want to talk about is uh, cache misses when we're doing something perfectly normal, and that's in the case of polymorphism. So let's say what I have right here is a test that does, it's a polymorphic test, polymorphic call test. On the left here, we have an instance of A, and we're calling a method on A 12 million times. And on the right, we have B, or A and B. They're both going into foo. Uh, and we're calling it, we're also calling 12 million methods on that side, too. You'll notice that I'm increasing I by 2 because I want the total number of method calls to be 12 million. So I want to measure how long it takes to, to make 12 million method calls right here in foo. That's the important one. Boop. That one. So when we run this, you'll see that the left-hand side is faster than the right-hand side. We were able to run this, run this one more quickly. This polymorphic test is actually much slower. And the reason is because if we take a look at that call site inside of foo, we'll know, remember that the key is class of bar serial number. And if we think about the values that are running through that method, it's going to be a dot serial number, b dot serial number, a dot serial number, b dot serial number. So we're oscillating between those two on every method call which means that that cache is never hit. We never hit that cache. It's always something different. So this call site here inside of foo, it always sees A. It only sees the class A. On the right-hand side, it sees A and B. It sees those two. So when we have a call site that sees one type, we can call that site, that call site monomorphic. That is the name of it. So now if you, when you go back to work on Monday, you can say, oh, these, Ruby has monomorphic, uh, monomorphic inline caches. Uh. <laughs> call sites with two or more, we can call those polymorphic. And if they have too many, there's another, another term. If there's just too many, and we'll talk about too many later, it's megamorphic. So let's call, <laughs> too many, what is too many? 
<laughs> we'll talk about too many. So how do we make this faster? So today, the cache, the cache code looks something like this. We say, OK, look up the class, compare the serial number on the class to the serial number in the cache. If, that, if they're the same, then we got a hit. Otherwise, we need, to, we need to get the serial number, find the method, and set all of those. Set that in the cache. So today, what we have is a monomorphic inline cache. We call it a monomorphic inline cache. We'll break this down a little bit. It's inline because it's inside the bytecode. It's a cache because it's a cache. Huh? <laughs> it's monomorphic because it only stores one value. So what I would like is to have a future cache that looks something like this, where we say, hey, you know what? Instead of just storing one value, let's have an array of values where we can store maybe two or three, two or three different values, right? We'll say, like, I, you know, if we just have a short little cache in there, maybe we can look up two or three values. So when we're talking about too many, we're saying, well, how long does that array have to get before it doesn't pay off, right? Clearly, we don't want to cache like thousands of entries. It would just be too slow to search through thousands of entries. So when we say too many, that's what we're talking about. So what I would like to have is a case where we say, OK, let's, let's store like two or three values and see what, that, see what that looks like. Now, this type of caching when we're storing multiple is called a polymorphic inline cache because it's, we're storing multiple values in line, and it's a cache. Yay. We did it. Woo. So I wrote a patch to do that. This is, now we're, we're winding into the failure part of the presentation. <laughs> so I wrote a patch for that, and this is it. And I want you to read it very closely, because there's going to be a test on it later. And that is the whole thing. OK. You get it? Good. Perfect. It's actually a 186-line diff, which actually isn't too bad. 186 lines, and that's the entire diff. So it wasn't even 186 lines of change. And if we run this polymorphism test again, these two, these two tests, if we run those again, actually the numbers are almost identical. All right. Mission accomplished. Woo! <laughs> All right. Actually, let's do that one more time. This is such a... Man. I'm so proud of this transition. I wore, like, I was up really late last night doing this one. All right, so, okay. We did this. It's great. Great. We're caching this stuff. These benchmarks look amazing. Uh, polymorphic calls are exactly the same speed as monomorphic calls. Everything's great. But we need to do one more important thing, and that is we need to measure, measure impact. We need to measure real-world impact, unfortunately. This is where things suck. Nobody wants to measure real-world impact. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> so one performance tip to all of you is uh, to only speed up bottlenecks. <laughs> Please, <laughs> make sure it's a bottleneck before you need to speed it up. So all right, how do we determine whether or not we're having a bottleneck with uh, polymorphic call sites? So that's, what, that's really what this optimization is doing, is speeding up polymorphic call sites. So the question is, what percentage of call sites are actually polymorphic, and how can we measure that? So in order to answer this question, what I did is I added logging to that cache key lookup, that place where we were talking about that cache hit or miss. I added logging to that particular section of code. Here it is again, yet another test. Woo! Actually, that's the entire diff. It was actually really easy. That's the whole thing. So what this allows us to do is it gives us a trace point inside of Ruby where we can log each inline cache hit or miss. So what I did is I wrote this. This is an example of it. We can say, all right, let's have a new trace point. And we care about, um, we, we want to print out the call site info. That's information about the particular call site. And we care about hits and misses. We want, we want to know about both of those. So anytime there's an inline cache or a, a miss, this block will execute. Uh, so then what we do is we enable that down here at the bottom. So if we read this carefully, we'll see that after this trace point is turned on, we actually have um, one, two call sites. So a.foo is a call site, and then bar.baz is another call site after we enable logging. So when we run this program, that's what we'll see. We actually see two, two logs output. And the values over there are the call site ID. So it's a unique ID for that particular call site, then a serial number, and that's the serial number of the class. That's our cache key. And then finally, just the class itself for me to read, because I do not know what these numbers mean. Reading a number makes, doesn't really help out humans very much. So let's take a look at more calls. This is, a, this is a sample program. We got a ton of stuff over here. And I've broken it down into the stuff we care about on the right. 
So in this particular case, we've got a polymorphic method. We've got two, or a polymorphic call site. Uh, we're passing instances of A and B through foo and recording all those values. And if we, if we uh, sum all those values together, we get an idea of what it looks like. We say, we see that we have um, a total of four call sites and three of those call sites see one type. So three of those call sites are monomorphic. And one of those call sites sees two types. So one of the call sites is polymorphic. So now we have a framework for understanding what percentage of our calls are polymorphic versus monomorphic, right? So what I did is I ran this against our application at work. This is our app. You can go to this, go to this uh, page on GitHub to see our application. We, we have one of the largest open source Rails apps I've seen. Um, and I also wanted to run it against this because this is where my wor I work. It's my job. So I should probably do that. <laughs> so I ran this against our application and uh, put our Rails app into production mode and ran um, about 1,600 requests through it. And this logged nearly 4 million calls. So there's 4 million data points for us to look at. And the bad news is, OK, here is the graph that shows the bad news. <laughs> This is the very bad news. This is a graph. All right. So on the very left there, that is, our, that is the number of monomorphic calls. OK? That one next to it right here, that's two. That's two calls, polymorphic calls. So what this optimization did is it optimized that. <laughs> So a very, out of millions and millions of method calls, only that percentage would be optimized by this optimization. So what we're saying here with this graph is that most call sites are monomorphic. They have one, one type passes through them in our application. So some interesting stuff I learned from this. Let's break this down a little bit more. So here's our original, uh, here's our original gra graph. We had some call sites that had 1,600 types pass through them. One call site had 1,600 different types. So what was that? I tracked that down, and what it was is it's uh, actually the source was a vent machine. We used, uh, at the time, we were using Thin as our uh, web server. Thin uses a vent machine. And if you look inside of a vent machine, every time it allocates a, allocates a connection, this is actually, I think, connection.new, you'll see inside of it, it says allocate.instance eval. Oops. We're accessing a singleton class there. So it's breaking the cache for that particular instance. So every, every one of those, none of those event machine uh, connections will ever hit cache. So that's, that's where those 1,600, uh, that 1,600 came from. I did about 1,600 requests. Event machine made about 1,600 connections. So boom, there you go. All right, so let's look at call sites where the number of types is two. So that might be interesting. This is a graph where the number of call sites is two. And I just want you to look at the shape of the graph. So what's interesting is we have on the left here one that, that is heavily used and has two types. And I know you can't read it. I had to do this in R. Apparently, R is the only thing that can handle this type of graph. Here's a subset of the values. I want to zoom in a little bit here on these top, these top values. The very top value is two. We're going to look at those two types. It's either a set or an array. That was the very top value. And I found the place in the code that does that, and it was saying, hey, does this in dot include? And what it was is mime types. We were saying, hey, do, does this list of mime types include something? For so, so for some reason, this list of mime types was either a set or an array. Why, why was it an array sometimes? I have no idea. But maybe we want to just turn that into a set, and now this is no longer polymorphic. The next thing was array and nil. Uh, and it was saying, like, hey, is this thing blank? Why is it nil sometimes? I don't know. The next thing was symbol and string, and we were just calling 2s on, calling 2s on those. And what I, think, what I think is interesting about these two different types is that these, these call sites with these types didn't seem to be, uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking for, intentional. It didn't seem like they were intentional. So there's an array sometimes, but it, it could have been a set. There's no reason for it to be an array. Uh, and if it was nil, in those cases, it could have been an array. There was no reason for us to make sure it was an empty array. Uh, string and symbol and string, this one's a little bit more difficult, though. So very few of these, very few of these call sites were actually for performance or behavior related. 
uh, reasons. So for example, I want to give you a little bit of an example of performance-related uh, polymorphism. So for example, let's say you have this instance foo, and you have a predicate method on there that's foo is thing equals equals interesting. So every time you ask foo, are you interesting, it has to do that comparison, right? One technique we can do is, if we have to call interesting many times, what we can do is calculate that on allocation, on creation of the object, and we just allocate a subclass that we know is interesting, and we'll just return foo every single time. So this is an example of how we can use polymorphism to remove runtime conditionals from our code. The other, thing, the other example might be behavior. So let's say we want to configure some object with particular behaviors. So we'll conf configure it with different types, depending on the behavior that we want. It was very rare for me to see this type of polymorphism, this type of polymorphism that I would say is intentional polymorphism. I very rarely saw that. All right, so it is time for me to STFU. <laughs> so it's only a failure if you learn nothing, I think. And even though we have failed at this, the, this polymorphic inline cache isn't going to help out our application. At least I learned something along the way, and I hope that I can relay to the rest of you the things that I learned. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about this is that a polymorphic inline cache is load specific. So it wouldn't help out our application, but it may help out your application. I don't necessarily know that our code is representative of, the, of code at large. Right? It could be that our code is a total outlier, and we don't know it. It could be that all of you out here are using this really important polymorphism stuff, and this would help you out tons, and I just don't know it. So what I would ask you is, if you have time, go check out my uh, fork of Ruby. Check out these two branches on GitHub. Uh, the top one, the pick one, that has the inline cache, so you can test out your code. And then that IC measure one, that has the, uh, the logging code in it. If you combine the two, then you can get those two at the same time. The other thing is, only optimize code that matters. Of course, please, I should drive this home. Only optimize code that matters. I am not going to push for this code upstream because it doesn't really matter. And take measurements. Please take measurements. If, you don't, if you're doing optimizations without taking measurements, how do you know that the optimization worked? <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people do this without measuring. Uh, and also, finally, use more polymorphism, please. <laughs> Make my work worthwhile. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>